Uh, welcome to Texas Winter. Or as my friends up north call, a balmy 32. But anyway, we're glad you're here. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that we are honored to have you in our presence. We have several visiting with us, and some of them are, some of our visitors are looking for a church home. We believe that you found it. We hope that you feel that way. We want you to be comfortable here. And if you have any questions, please see one of us. The elders will be passing up and down the aisles during our invitation song this morning. Uh, notice who they are. Grab one of them. Tell them you need to talk to them. They'll find you. Do that. We'll get that taken care of. But we're excited. Uh, if you were not here last week, you uh, may not realize that uh, we had uh, uh, Penny uh, Hughes. Is Penny here this morning? I th- yeah, there she is right down here. Penny Hughes placed membership last Sunday. And also, where's Chris? Is Chris around? Is Chris here? Where's he at? Where's Chris? Chris, raise your hand. Chris was baptized last Sunday. <laughs> Welcome to the family. He was sitting there going, I don't know what he's talking about. But Chris was uh, immersed last Sunday. We're excited about that, too. Glad that you're here this morning. We're going to sing some songs of praise this morning. We're going to take 30 to 60 seconds, just real quick, to welcome the people that are around you. If you see someone you don't know, introduce yourself. You may meet somebody that's been here as long as you have. And uh, especially if they're visiting, you'll get to meet them. So let's take opportunity to do that this morning. Let's stand and greet one another before we get into our worship. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works, blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Come, blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in your praises as your people declare your mighty works. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who reigns forevermore, who reigns forevermore. Be 
seated, please. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in name of man or creed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name, do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed has God decreed, do all in the name of the Lord. Be not deceived by worldly greed. Do all in the name of the Lord. The Spirit says in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name. Do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed as God decreed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Till toils and labors here are done, do all in the name of the Lord. Dear Christian friends, if you be one, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name, do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed, as God decreed, do all in the name of the Lord. We humbly bow before you. We know you are the great I am, that you have given us everything, life itself. You have breathed into us and created us in your image. And, Father, we cannot even grasp that, but we thank you. We are such a blessed people, blessed to be part of the kingdom, part of your family, but above all, knowing that our names are written in the book of life and that we have a home in heaven someday. Father, just help us as we here, especially at West Freeway and around the world, Christians everywhere, that we will glorify and honor you, and we will help bring others to be part of that kingdom too. Father, it's such a privilege that we have to talk to you and, and petition you on behalf of those we love. We want to especially today pray for Jim York. Father, may your will be done in his life and be with Margaret and the, the kids. Father, we don't understand. We know that it is part of life. But if it be your will that he can recover, we pray that that will be. But if not, give him peace, Father. And for others, for Matt Cassidy, who's in the hospital, and Jane Griffin, and probably many others that I'm not aware of, bless those that their bodies will heal and they'll, they'll recover. And all those that are suffering at home and, and in care facilities, and we know that there are some with terminal cancer, and Father, we just pray that you'll be with all. But thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our God. And above all, thank you for allowing Jesus to come to this earth and die for us. We can never understand, never fully grasp that the love that sent him here, but we, we are so thankful. May we love you in just a little bit of that as we try to be just like Christ. Bless us here, though, at West Freeway and all the staff and the, the elders and the deacons and each member as they labor and work in your kingdom. Bless us, Father, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning before our lesson is from Colossians 3 verses 1 through 3 and 15 through 17. Since then you have raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. 
And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and paces his will to make known the wicked oppressing now from distressing, sing praises to his name, he fails not his own. We all who exalt thee, thou king of the nation, and pray that thou still our defender will be. May thy congregation escape tribulation, be thou Story counted once among the lost, yet one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. Who saved us from eternal prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper let's consider the Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 27 and 28 when they were eating Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and, and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body then he took the cup and when he had given thanks he said he gave it to them saying drink from it all of it this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins I tell you I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom let's pray father we come before you and we're so thankful that we realize that through Christ, you've given us the hope of living with you forever. We pray that you will be with all of us as we focus our minds at this time on the verses that we just read and realizing that Christ is with us today and he's drinking of the cup and we're drinking of the blo his blood and we're taking of his body. Father, help us to focus on what that means to us. What it means to us looking back to the cross, what it means to us today, and what it will mean to us in the future when we're living with you forever. Father, be with us at this time as we partake of the bread that is a symbol of the Christ body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray again, please. Father, at this time, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, which is a symbol of the blood, the lifeblood that Christ gave, help us to realize, Father, there is no way that we can have a life with you without becoming in contact with the blood of Christ. Father, we pray that we realize at this time as we partake of this cup what it means to us. We pray that we will all focus on what it means to us as far as in our life physically, but more importantly, Father, what it means to us spiritually as we long to be with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We consider at this time what, what we need to give back to God. Let's consider uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. This is, this is from a New Living Translation, but it basically says what it, what's intended. Give and you will receive. Your gift will re return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we can again come before you to praise your name, to thank you, Father, for the blessings of our life. And we realize, Father, we, we can't outgive you that, that you pour out spiritual and physical blessings beyond what we can imagine. And there are those in this life that, that, um, that need physical things that we can provide and we pray we'll realize that we can meet that need. And we also, Father, need to realize that we can meet their spiritual needs. Focusing on what's ultimately important, and that's for their soul to be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
children will be able to come bring their coins to Christ and go on to Bible times. Would you stand with me as we sing this song? Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. Thank you. Aren't those kids precious? Even when they sprawl right out on the floor. And if you didn't see that, Isaac took a tumble. And his money went rolling across. He goes, hey! <laughs> he was going to stop it dead in his tracks. What motivates you? I mean, stop and think about it. What is it that motivates you? You know, I've, asked, I've been asked that question all of my life. A young uh, lady one time, whenever I was standing at her door trying to sell her some greeting cards, said, what's your motivation behind doing this? Tell a nine, ask a nine-year-old that, and you're going to get an answer that you might not expect. And I said, I don't know. You see, y'all expected that one, so. I said, I don't know. And she goes, well, are you trying to make money? And I said, oh, I'm trying to save up enough points that I can get a tent. I know it's intense, but it's okay. Um, uh, but the thing is, is that was a motivation for me. I wanted so much to be able to purchase a tent. It reminded me of the first time I ever used something that our a lot of our folks don't know what is. How many of you have never used layaway? Have never used it? Oh, y'all, I'm in good shape. I've got several people. Most of us know what that is. That's great. But I was so motivated, I put a C, my first CB radio I put on layaway. It was $39 for a 16-year-old back in 1975. And I want to tell you something. That was a lot of money. That was almost a full week's paycheck for me. I was working at Kroger's, and I, got, I, I, I bought one. Put it on layaway. I paid $2 a week. You do the math. It took me a while. But giving up that $2 meant that I had to give up two meals every time I paid that $2. And I want to tell you what, it was so worth it. By the way, my CB handle was the deer run. So just to let you know, if you ever hear that, you'll know it's not me anymore. What motivates us? You know, when we bought this building, there were a lot of things that happened. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's going to work here. I know it is. No, it's not. And I've even got it on. Ba -boop, ba -boop. Ah, there it is. When we bought this building... I was motivated, and we got this process started. As far as I was concerned, I began thinking, we can now begin to focus on growth. 
and we did a lot of things and we had people that were here and working and all of, a lot of you came up and helped with that it was a great process I was so excited about it whenever I sat with the uh, the elders uh, that, at that time Chris and James were elders and they they were the ones that went to the title cup they said do you want to go I said oh can I please I wanted to go and be a part of that experience and then when we started doing the remodel, it was great to walk in and see all these great people working. I couldn't put everybody's picture on here or we'd have been just reminiscing all day. But so many of you did so many things. And I got to wondering, what was it that motivated us to do that? I asked somebody that this last week, and they said, well, it was basically money. <sighs> yeah, and, and I can see that. It wasn't that way in my mind. Because in my mind, I had been ta given the task of praying and striving with the elders to help us get out of debt. I don't know what I did. I didn't do anything. Because the only thing I did was every day, about five or six times a day for the last, or well, for the previous six years, I just prayed one prayer several times a day. God, get us where we need to be and let us trust you to do it. And look where we are. Are you excited? We're a year and a half into this. I'm excited. We're growing. I'm excited. You're doing more financially. I'm excited. You're doing more spiritually, and I'm excited. I'm excited because you're excited. I'm excited because I think God is working through us, and I think that's a great motivation for us. In Colossians 3 and verse 17, I don't know why this isn't working. Am I messing something up? I guess I am goofy with technology. Hit the next slide, please. I'm just going to hit, get y'all to do it, or you can bring that up. In Colossians 3, 17, it says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father. And then in Colossians 3 and verse 23, the very next slide, please. It does. Have, there we go. Whatever you do, do what? Work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, let's stop and think about that for just a minute. I believe that we serve a great God. I believe that with all of my heart. And our great God has given us His best and I also believe that as we do that we have to understand we've got to get it on the other computers what the problem is it's not this is that God too many times that we go through this we think well it's done we've done good enough we think well we've done our part we're here we look around and we we see the great things that are going on and and today I asked Steve I said Steve can you and Doug do me a favor? Yes. I said, good, I need this sign put up. He says, okay, we'll do it, but we're not going to do it next week. It's gotten to that point now. I have to schedule it. I don't just say, hey, would you go do this? And they just jump to it. Now they're scheduled. No, next week's, this week's Thanksgiving. And so he said next week, and I understood that. But there are things going on all the time that we don't see. We see the results of it, but we don't always see the working that goes on there. But for many of us, I'm afraid, I don't want us to get to this point, but I'm afraid some of us maybe get to the point where we're just saying, well, it's good enough. Huh. Well, what's good enough? I mean, folks, you've got to take into consideration some of the things that God wants us to see, and I think it's important that we do. What we need to be doing is asking ourselves, let's have that next slide. What we need to be doing is asking ourselves, if we're doing our best, do the best you can with what you have but do it now and that is a daily thing that's not something that we just do one time that's a daily thing do the best you can with what you have but you do it now don't wait don't wait to the last minute the first thing on your on your uh, uh, handout this morning our calling from God demands more from us than good enough it requires our best efforts. How many of you would like to have a half-baked ham? Anybody? 
Now, there may be some crazy person out there that could eat it. Why do we not want a half-baked ham? Because a half-baked pork will do what? can make you sick. There are certain things that are going to make us deal with things in a different way. We don't want to be half-baked when we do stuff. We want to make sure that it's done correctly, thoroughly. Yes, and I understand that. But in their devotional guide, Experiencing God Day by Day, Henry and Richard Blackerby asked the question, are you satisfied with merely knowing the acts of God, or do you also want to know his ways? Are you satisfied with just knowing the acts of God, the creation how this, you know, those seven days went. You know, most of us concentrate on that last one. On the seventh day, God rested. We like that one. We're not so much caring about the rest of it. It just all happened. We're just ready for the rest. We want the siesta. We want the time to, to relax and to do that. And this is a question I think that we need to answer and answer in a way that, we gives, that gives us the determination of our depth and our stability in our relationship with God. And you say, what do you mean? Well, let's take some time together and study this principle of one thing, and that is excellence. I want you to keep that word in the back of your mind, excellence. Because we as a church family need to be understanding of excellence. We need to know what it means to have excellence in our life. Excellence. What does it mean to have excellence in our lives? What is it? And if we're going to strive for something, we need to know what it is. According to the dictionary, the word excellence is a noun, meaning the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. A lot of us think, well, that leaves me out. No, it doesn't. In fact, this is something that every one of us have the ability to do, and that is to be excellent in serving and working with God, loving God, and being cared for by God. It's all a matter of excellence. We can have that. We can have that understanding. Excellence is something that is rather subjective because how do you know if you're excelling in something? Well, there's always those benchmarks that we, we look at and we say, okay, I've met this goal, I've met this goal, and I've reached this benchmark, and I want to move higher, and I want to move stronger. Some of us don't ever get to the point where we've reached the benchmarks that we are expecting upon ourselves or that we feel like God is having in our lives. I would have the definition of excellence is doing something the very best with what you have to work with. Do what you can with what you have, but do it now. Do the best you can with what you have and do it now. That's what it's talking about. However, mediocrity the definition is this. It's an adjective on, of only moderate quality. I like the last part, not very good. Moderate to inferior in quality. Ordinary. Or synonyms. Average. Many of us, too many of us, I think, are happy with average. God didn't ask for us to be average. God wants us to be excellent. Because he created us to be excellent. He created us as his children, forgiving of, us, of our sins, to be excellent. To have that opportunity to understand. And we should strive for excellence in all we do in life. Everything that we do. If we're painting a wall, it needs to be excellent. Contract painters used to call missed spots lookouts. I know because I, I, I've been around some. And, and they'd see a spot and there's a lookout and, and there's a lookout. And, and they'd go by and they'd, they'd put tape up there so that they could mark it. And they had a guy that would come back behind them and they'd take and they'd touch that spot up and they'd touch this spot up and they'd touch that spot up. Why? Because they wanted the work to be what? Mediocre? No. Excellent. They didn't want flaws to be seen. Were there flaws? Oh, yes. Some that went undetected. But whenever they saw the flaws, they did everything they could to repair them or make them better, 
to go into that next step of excellence. What would happen to a church if everyone in the congregation strove for excellence? Growth. If we all strove to be excellent in what we were doing and the way that we were living our lives, this church would grow exponentially. So that means that maybe there's some of us that aren't quite there yet. And that's okay because it is still what? Growth. That means it's a growing process. We're not all going to reach it. And I don't want you to beat yourself up saying, well, I'm not where I want to be. Guess what? Neither am I. Neither are our elders. We're not where we want to be. We want to be continually striving to grow in the areas that God wants us to grow in. And that means that if we grow in those areas, we're going to continue to be what God wants us to be. In Colossians 3, verse 23, in the New American Standard, says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, not an inheritance, the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. See, he doesn't say you're going, to get a, you're going to get a gift. He says you're going to get the gift. You're going to get the inheritance, not a, an inheritance or an inheritance. You're going to get the inheritance, which is what? Heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Oh, wow. I get chills when I start thinking about being able to run up and, and see God's face, to see Jesus, and just to be able to walk by possibly and say, thank you. One more time, thank you. Face to face with Christ my Savior. What will my answer be? Mm. I can only imagine what it must feel like for those who have gone on to do that. See, our efforts... And what we do are a reflection of God in our lives. In the context of verses 23 and 24 in Colossians 3 that we have here, it's dealing with slaves. Now, put yourself in that position. None of us have ever been slaves. None of us in this audience have, hopefully, I hope that you haven't ever been a slave. So somebody says, well, this doesn't really apply to me. Yes, it does, because we were slaves to what? Sin. We have to over, we've overcome that. I know some of you work from home or you have a job that where you know you, you don't have to dress up for your job. You don't have to wear a certain uniform or, 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 or clothing. My son this morning, as they were leaving to go to Dallas, he wanted to be here and some things changed, but he looked at me and says, I, I didn't have my tie on yet and I didn't have my coat. And he says, Oh, have you gone casual in your preaching? Hey, I've never been casual in my preaching. It's not what I mean. I mean, the way you're dressing, I mean, you're in slacks and a shirt. And, and, and he said, I'm doing that more. He says, I have a hard time walking in in his business. He said, I have a hard time walking in anywhere where I don't have a town. He's in sales, national sales. And he walks into these places. He says, I have a hard time walking in without a town. Although it's becoming more accepted and a lot of times it makes people feel less intimidated. He said, what do you think about that? And I said, I'm going to go put my tie on. <laughs> and he said, why do you wear a tie, Dad? And I said, because mm, I always have. I said, I very seldom ever preached on a Sunday morning without a tie. Why? Why do you do that? I said, it's all in perception, son. He says, exactly. And I want people to perceive that I am giving God my best. Amen. See, God doesn't want mediocrity. God doesn't want average. God doesn't want just do whatever. I love the idea of come as you are. I don't want people to feel like they've got to come here and wear a three-piece suit every Sunday. That's ridiculous. My daddy wanted me to do that. I said, That's... He said you ought to be in a three-piece suit, son. He also said I didn't need to be a preacher. He said, why in the world would you want a job where you've got 300 bosses? Oh, y'all didn't like that one? I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Stop and think about this a minute. What he meant was 
You're not going to please everybody all the time. But folks, I want to tell you something. There's only one person that we've got to please, and that's my God and Savior. I've got to please Him. And in doing so, when I love Him, I'm going to love my neighbors as they need to be loved. I'm going to offer my excellence or my striving to be excellent. I'm not going to be a slave to the world. God has never accepted second best. In Leviticus 22, 17 to 25, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons and all the sons of Israel, and say to them, Any man of the house of Israel or of the aliens in Israel who, pre uh, who uh, uh, presents his offering, whether it is any of their uh, votive or any of their free will offerings, which they present to the Lord for a burnt offering, for you to be accepted, it must be a male without what? defect from the cattle the sheep the goats whatever has a defect you shall not offer for it will not be accepted for you when a man offers a sacrifice of peace offering to the lord to fulfill a special vow or for a free will offering of the herd or of the flock it must be perfect to be accepted there shall be no defect in it those that are blind or fractured or maimed, or having running sore, or uh, eczema, or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make any of them an offering by fire on the altar to the Lord. In respect to an ox or a lamb which has overgrown or stunted member, you may present it for a free will offering, but for a vow it will not be accepted. Also, anything that uh, with his testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord or sacrifice in your land, nor shall you accept any such from the hand of a foreigner for offering as the food of your God. For their corruption is in them. They have a defect. They shall not be accepted for you. Do not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep that has any defect or flaw in it, for the, that would be detestable to him. God doesn't want average. God doesn't want bruised, broken. Wait a minute. Then how, who do we go to to share our gospel message if it's not the broken if it's not those who are bruised, if it's not those who are less than perfect, who do we go to? We're looking at two different things here. This is what God wants from his children. But before you come to God, or when you come to God, and you bring him your life, and you become his child, from that point forward, God says, I want excellence. Are we going to always attain it? No. We're not. Is that okay? Yes, it is. For the blood of Christ continually cleanses his children. See, God doesn't require perfection. He requires excellence. Can excellence be found in imperfect things? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Look at us. We're not perfect, but we can maintain and strive for excellence. What does it mean doing the best you can with what you've got? Boy, that puts a limit on it, doesn't it? But he also says, and do it now. In Leviticus 22 and 20, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the sons of Israel. But notice verse 20. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it will not be accepted for you. God's not going to put up with mediocrity from his children who give it on purpose. But those of us who are striving toward excellence, straining to be what we need to be, God says, that I'll take. Because that's what we're striving to do. Giving your best as a matter of trust. 
So the question comes, do we trust God enough to accept us if we're doing our best? So what are some of the areas of our observation concerning excellence? Well, let's take a look because excellence doesn't happen by accident. Excellence takes work. God did not give us an average effort or average blessing. He gave us his best. He expects us to be excellent. So number four here, excellence takes work. We're going to have to do something ourselves to ourselves. Work at being excellent. Offering excellence. It's not to gain our salvation because who is he talking to? He's talking to people who are already in a right relationship with him. So if we have been forgiven of our sins, we as the children of God are supposed to do what? Work. And the thing is, is that excellence is evidenced in the details. Everything that we do, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all what? To the glory of God. In the name of the Lord. Do it to his glory for that purpose, not our purpose. Not so people can pat you on the back and say, hey, you did a good job. Although, is it okay to say, hey, you did a good job? Absolutely. Encouragement's one of the things that we're supposed to do with each other. But that's not the matter that he's talking about here because excellence is striving for excellence takes daily diligence. It takes us doing something on a regular basis. Diligently. Doing it for God. Aristotle said this, what we, or we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And then finally, number four here, we have to strive daily for that excellence. It takes daily diligence and daily striving. We have to do that on a regular basis. We have to understand what it means to strive toward excellence. Nolan Ryan, how many of y'all don't know who this is? Okay, some of you don't know who that is. Okay. Nolan Ryan is the, my hero. One of them. Uh, he is a, a pitcher, came from Alvin, Texas, down on the coast and, and uh, close to Houston. I want you to look at his record, 324 wins, 292 losses, 5,714 strikeouts, seven no-hitters. He threw seven games that nobody hit the ball. Excellence, yes. Was it per perfect? No. What's wrong with here, this thing? Number one, he had 324 wins and what? 292 losses. He had 5,714 strikeouts. He faced 20,000 batters. I didn't put that on there. He pitched in over 500 games and had seven of those he pitched no hitters. There's a, such a thing in baseball called a perfect game. How many of y'all have ever witnessed one? Anybody? Ronnie, raise your hand. It's okay. That's where nobody gets a hit. Nobody gets to base. Nobody walks. Every ball is caught. The only thing is, is it's really not a perfect game because in those games, in a perfect game, the pitcher still throws some pitches that are balls. They're not strikes. He said, why are you bringing this up? See, Nolan Ryan doesn't strive for perfection. Nolan Ryan strove for excellence. There's only been one perfect being in this world. And that's Jesus Christ. He does not expect you to be perfect. But he does expect you to do your best and strive toward that perfection. In his book, When God Builds a Church, Bob Russell said this, people who are committed to the mediocrity will resent excellence. They'll say, you're too into performance. It's all just a show, a big moneymaker, but it's not about performance. Excellence is about utilizing your gifts to build up the body, not the building, the body. It's about giving Christ the first fruits. It's about doing everything we can do to win and that win is heaven. Now, I don't know where you are. 
I really don't. But how can we strive for a standard of excellence here at West Freeway? I want you to think about that for just a moment. How do we do that? Well, we have to do it now. Whatever it is, whatever we do, in word or deed, we do it when? Now. Do the best you can with what you've got, but do it now. It's not tomorrow. It's not in the future. It's not the goals that we set. It's about doing the best we can with what God has blessed us with and doing it now. It's doing it to give him the glory that he deserves. What can we do now? Attend Bible classes. It just irks me when people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I just don't feel a part. And they're never here. They're here for this hour-long service. Some of y'all think are three hours, but it's an hour-long service. And that's enough, and yet feel unappreciated, unloved, and uncared for. What if you showed up for work one day a week? How many of you would expect a full paycheck? The millennials, keep your hands down, please. I saw you smile. I'm watching you. Stop teasing. Take notes. Study. Stay, implement some study time at home. And pray for a better expectation based on your input. Don't expect the church to be any better than you are. Sad that we have to remind ourselves of that, but it's okay. Bob Russell also says, your level of expectation is directly linked to the amount of preparation you have done. How are you doing? How much preparation are you putting in to being a Christian, to being a child of God here at West Freeway? Don't trust your own evaluation. Take a look at what God wants from you. If ministries are no longer working, drop it. If an activity or ministry is no longer fruitful, Drop it. If something worked well 5, 10, or 20 years ago, doesn't mean it'll still work today. Drop it. You don't change the message. You change the way you present it. If it's not, worse, if it's not working, replace it. Jewel Miller is great if you've got somebody that can sit through it. Some of y'all don't have a clue who Jewel Miller is, and I'm... I understand that. But it comes a time whenever you have to let go of the past. Mike, I appreciate the fact that you guys don't run the wing tee anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thankful they don't run the single wing. Why? It doesn't work. Very few teams in football use plays that were good 60 years ago. Although you spring some of them on them and they do work occasionally. But why do they do that? Because they have to go with what's working. And it's time for us to do that here. What's going to work, not to bring people in, but to get people to heaven. I'm not worried about bringing people in as much as I'm bringing, about bringing people to Christ and helping them get to heaven. And if that's our goal, that's what God is going to bless us with. Don't be afraid of change. If you have a flat tire, what do you do? Well, I just ride on it until it falls off. I go down the interstate and just hope the sparks don't catch the grass on fire. Don't drive your car until you cannot put more oil in it and trade it off and think that's going to fix the problem. You go out and buy you another car and do the same thing. There are certain things that we have to do. We're going to have to change some of the things that we're doing to make it work, striving for excellence through continuous improvement. Striving for excellence through continuous improvement. We need to do that, but we also need to do it without extravagance. We don't have to have an extravagant building. We have to have a clean, open, usable building. But God needs clean, open, usable people to be a part of the kingdom of God that are striving for excellence. 
Perfection is not attainable outside of heaven. We're not going to be perfect. But we have, and if we chase perfection, we have that opportunity to chase it. We can catch excellence. None of us are going to be perfect. But we are going to be able to catch excellence. I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting to me. Anybody know who this is? His name is Stradivari. And Stradivari was a fiddle maker. No, he was a violin maker. He made the most expensive violins. But there's one thing Stradivari said about his violins and to his workers. I will not put my name on something that is not excellent. And he never used the word perfect. Because even Stradivari, the master of making violins, knew that perfection was not attainable. But excellence was. So what do you do? What is it that motivates you to be where you need to be, where God wants you to be? See, it needs to come from inside. It needs to be you saying, I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got, and I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to do it for God. I'm not going to do it for me. I'm not going to do it for the preacher. I'm not going to do it for the elders. I'm not going to do it for my family. I'm going to do it for me. I want to be the best that I can be for God. And when you do that, you can rejoice. Did I miss the slide? Yes. You can rejoice always. You can always rejoice when you do the best you can with what you've got and do it now. As a child of God, I think that needs to motivate us to bring, be that excellence and have that excellence that God wants. I wanted, when I was a child, to be a professional baseball player. I gave it everything I could. Most of the time. Somebody says, is that why you're a preacher? No. No. Because when I had that goal, I hadn't even heard of the church. But when a man came to me and said, you can be a part of God's family. And you can go to heaven. There were a lot of things that took the back seat. And I have rejoiced ever since. I have not been perfect. I'm not always striven for excellence like I should. But I want to go there, don't you? I want to go to be with God in heaven. And if you're not ready to do that today, we're going to offer this invitation song. Our elders are going to pass among us. If you need to stop one of them and ask them for prayer or talk to them about what we're saying, about attaining that excellence, Stop them and grab them. If we can help you down front, do that. If like Chris, you want to you obey God and, and put him on in baptism and wash away your sins, we want to be able to do that. But folks, what we do not want to do is do what we've always done and get absolutely nothing accomplished. It's time for us to move forward and seek and serve God with excellence. What's motivating you this morning? Are you ready to rejoice? If you need to come, whatever your needs are, we're here to bless them. Won't you come while Chris leads us in a song? Come while we stand and sing.
Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Father, we give thanks for this day that you've given us to come together as your children, to come worship you, the true and living God. Father, help us take a lesson this morning to, to our lives and help us understand that we will not be perfect. But Father, will help us know that our love for you will motivate us for that excellence, to be the children you want us to be. Father, let us be those examples to those that do not know Christ. Father, may, may they see Christ within us and how we talk and how we act. Father, help us to know that your love for us has always been there. And Father, at this time, our hearts are heavy knowing that Jim York is in the hospital, Father, and Father, be with him and Margaret and the family. Let them know that we love them and that we're here for them. And Father, there are others. There's Francis Thompson and Jim Turner and all the others that I cannot mention at this time but are on our hearts. Father, be with their family. Comfort them as you can. And Father, be with us for the remainder of this day and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted day and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on fire, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by.